welcome to a most interesting talk, I'm sure, about the Emacs Sort Mode. Um, it's difficult to say what exactly Emacs Sort Mode will do for you. It's probably easier to list all the things it doesn't do, because that's a considerably smaller list. So let's welcome Professor Dominic. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Carsten Dominik. I'm um, a professor at the University of Amsterdam and also at the University of Nijmegen. And uh, I was invited here today to talk about a little software project. I would like to start by saying that I'm not a software person. I'm not a programmer, I'm not an IT person. I'm really I'm a scientist and I do this uh, kind of programming as a hobby. Most of the coding for this project has been has taken place on a train, on the commuter train. I sit in the train every day for one hour and I take that uh, time to write some programs, and, uh, so that's, uh, that's what I'm doing. And I want to talk to you about Emacs Alt Mode, which is a system to track projects, to write down notes, to draft papers, and all of that using plain text files. So really, as simple as possible, it sounds, at first I think it sounds really archaic, and uh, people wonder why should we actually leave all these fancy, sexy programs which we have on our computers and for which we have paid uh, big money and just throw them away and use a much uh, simpler system. But I have, would like to try today to show you and maybe convince you that this is actually a viable approach which can be useful for many different things. I told you that I'm a teacher at the university and I'm used to getting questions all the time. That's what my students do. So please feel free to ask me any questions at any moment uh, during the talk if I'm going too fast or too slow or something like this. First of all, I have to show this slide I was told, uh, just for legal reasons, this talk is being recorded and that means uh, whatever you say can, can and will be used against you. <laughs> so, be warned. Alt mode. It's already it starts by the name. It's a really strange name for a program, I guess. And I often get this question, why is this uh, such a silly name, alt mode? Well, what is the reason for this? Well, the org is just uh, because it has to do with organizing. What, the, what this uh, program tries to do is help organize many things for normal life and also for life as a scientist. And mode, it's called alt mode because it's not really a standalone, pro standalone program, it's a mode, an editing mode of the Emacs editor. I'm not sure if everybody knows what I'm talking about here, so let me just uh, back up a little bit. Okay, 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 one step back. What is Emacs? Does everybody know here what Emacs is? Really? Nobody says no? No? Oh, okay, somebody says no. Emacs is one of the oldest uh, editors in the computer world, I think. It has, has existed for decades. It's, uh, it was uh, written by Richard Stallman, which is the founder of the Free Software Foundation. And um, so it really starts at the beginning of everything that is open source and free software, what we are using now very often. And also in our institute, for example, we are using lots of open source and uh, free programs these days. So Emacs is an editor. What is it? OK. It's an editor for text files. And while it does have a nice window environment and you can uh, use the mouse to uh, execute commands. It's really at its best with keyboard commands. It's a very efficient and fast uh, program to work with uh, once you have learned all those keys, which initially is always a big hurdle, but this time you find out that this is actually the best way. It's actually also better for your hands in order to avoid uh, illnesses like RSE or something like this. <clears throat> very important is that Emacs is self-documenting. So any programs which run in Emacs are written in a way that every function, every variable, everything the program is done is documented internally and you can access this documentation at any point. So that's automatic. There are basically no undocumented programs in Emacs. It's automatically built in. It's highly customizable. You can really change whatever you want. And this is um, really why I started working with this program because um, I like things to work the way I want them. I know exactly what I want and I like programming environments where I can change everything in the way how I want to have it. And it's highly expandable. So that means you can, well, not easily, but if you know how to write Lisp code, which is a programming language which is being used uh, for the extensions in Emacs, if you can uh, write that, then you can extend it. 
And Emacs has modes, and this is where the name alt mode comes from. It has minor modes and major modes, and these are just sort of little packages which change the behavior of the editor in a certain way. For example, if you are programming, programming in some language, for example in R, there is a special mode in Emacs which, uh, which uh, can highlight the R commands in the syntax way, colorize them, or give you special editing commands for this. And there's also big packages which you can implement in this way, and alt mode is one of those packages which works like this. So alt mode is a major mode for Emacs, not a minor mode. A minor mode changes some detail. For example, do I automatically want lines to be wrapped around while I type or not? This is a minor mode. A major mode is uh, really something big. Well, and then the next question is, why would one want to use an editor as a base for an organization program? That's, uh, I think, a very good question, and uh, uh, one which has, has to be answered. Um, one reason is that where I work, Certainly half of the people use Emacs, because many of us uh, write programs, many of us uh, write papers in LaTeX, for example, and Emacs is really powerful to do this kind of stuff, so many of my colleagues do know how to use Emacs. But what is even more important is that this editor is actually an ultra-portable platform for running code. It's almost like a Java virtual, virtual machine, because Emacs has been ported to pretty much every system. It runs on some mobile phones, it runs on Linux computers, on Windows, on Macintosh, on, uh, on the VMS, and you, you can just uh, pick your system, and there is an Emacs implementation for this. And that means that anything which you program for Emacs will work on all these systems. So if your IT department head now decides that you all have to throw away your Windows computer and use Macintosh, Emacs will still work on that system, and uh, you can continue to use these programs. Another important thing is that there are many other useful systems which run inside Emacs, for example, email clients, uh, news group readers, or even, there's even a web browser inside there. And that makes a very good environment for integrating an organization program with these other tools. So you don't have to rely on a, on a company like Apple, which gives you a sort of a Catholic uh, experience on a computer where they determine everything for you, how you should be using it. But you can just uh, do it uh, with, a, with a system like this. Okay? So I hope that makes clear why alt mode has this stupid name, alt mode. The next thing is that this system is using text files, really plain text files. So this is not rich text in the way that uh, you have bold text and uh, italic text. Uh, this is not, not illicit. It's really like text files, like emails and the most basic kind of text. And this is really so 1970s. So why should one use this? Why is that useful? Well, I think it's extremely useful because it helps you to focus on content. It uh, stops you from playing with tools, and it helps you to focus on content. And of course, text files are really the only truly portable document format which exists. Because you, will, you were able to read text files 100 years ago, or maybe when the first computers came around, let's say, 40 years ago or so. And I'm sure you will be able to read text files 100 years from now. So this is really the basic format which will always ex exist. And that also means that if you collect your organizational data, you are, you are planning for, for projects and things like this, you will never be locked into a particular proprietary software. I mean, if you buy one of those programs, they all have their internal, internal format, and it's sometimes it's very hard to get your data back out. You have spent two years entering things uh, in, into this program, and then you decide to use a different one, and it's very difficult to actually switch over. This would never happen this, if you had used text files, because you can always use them and uh, get somebody to write a little parser for you, which will turn one thing into another. So this will, is, I think, is a very strong uh, point. And it can be easily processed with other tools. There's many tools which can read text files, change them, make small edits, automatically create items in your project lists, and things like this. So do I have another point here? Yes. Yeah, the, the, another interesting thing is that you can use version control to get a nice history of these files. It's much more difficult, for example, with a Word file to get, get a nice history, to be able to look back when did I make this change in the past. With simple text files, this is uh, much easier and much uh, more straightforward. So this is why I like text files and why I really work, work with them as much as possible. Okay, so let's um, 
try to start answering what alt mode does and what it is. At its core, alt mode is just an outliner. So I'm sure you all have worked with outliners. You can use Microsoft Word as an outliner, or there's an Omni outliner, for example, and a good program on the Macintosh and things like this, which create outlines. And the reason for this is that pretty much everything that has to be structured can be represented as an outline. An outline has uh, some main nodes, and then it has leaves and further children and things like this. It's very useful for organizing your thoughts, for doing brainstorming, and uh, for putting everything into a nice structure, which, uh, which helps you to think about it in a structured way. So that's uh, what it is at, at its base, a simple outline in, represented in plain text. And Altmood as an editing mode, it runs in an editor, so of course it can use and enhance all the features of this text editor, and therefore it makes it uh, very comfortable to work with this. I will show you a little bit uh, in a, a little bit later. I'll give you some examples how it makes it really easy writing things and re in particular reorganizing it. Very often, if you sit in a meeting and you have to type notes, it's just a brainstorming session. Everybody throws in a few ideas. And then in the end, you have to sit down and organize things. And the outline is really good, uh, good for this. Another point is that outlines, of course, are also the basic structure of the scientific output, which we have to produce out as uh, scientists. Because we have to write papers or books or presentations. And all of these uh, things um, can be thought of as an outline, where you have uh, headlines, major sections, and then uh, you filter it down into the, into the small details. Okay, so the outline keys, what you, uh, what you use in order to work with the outline. Um, most important ones in, in Altmund are the keys which let you change the visibility of the outline because you can fold away leaves in the outline in order to, make, to, to get a better overview. And then we have two commands really. One is to cycle the visibility of a subtree and the other one is to cycle the global visibility. That doesn't really mean much, so I'm going to show you uh, what I mean by this. So this is a view on a window in Emacs. I hope you can see it from the back because it's uh, implemented here as a movie. I think it's a little bit less sharp. But what you see here is two headlines in an outline, and uh, they are marked just by a single star here in front. If, it's, uh, it's a, if it would be a sub-node, then it would have several stars in front. That's what it looks like. And the points which I shown you behind that shows you that this is just uh, folded down. I'm sure you have seen uh, something like this also in other programs. And so we are now just going to use the tab key and the shift tab key in order to change. So tabbing, pressing tab once will actually show the list of subheadings here, and then we can just uh, move down to, uh, to one of the subheadings, press tab again, and you will actually just uh, zoom in uh, there and open this. Then you can go back and just fold it all back. And if you press now tab twice in a row, then you will not only get uh, to see the direct children, but actually everything which is below there. Yeah, and then you can fold it back up. So, and that was all done with one key. It's just a single key. You don't have to remember many commands. And the other command is shift tab. And if you press that, then you get first an, uh, something like which looks like a table of contents with all the headings. And if you press it again, then you actually get um, any text which is in this outline. And uh, pressing it one more time folds everything back up. So that means you only have two keys. And that is enough to, to look at this outline and to fold it and unfold it. That uh, makes it quite convenient, I think. The next important part is that you have to be able to restructure an outline. And I really cannot emphasize this enough. I think this is one of the main functionalities which Ordmos does well and this, which most outlines don't do well. Because normally, to restructure something like this, it means you have to cut something away, to move to a different location, to paste it in, to change uh, the level on which it is. It is a tedious arbeit. In Ordmos, it works more like that you you can imagine to just hold on to one leaf in the outline tree and then just slide it around in in the entire outline. It's like with a, with a hot knife through butter. That's what it mainly does. So you hold down the meta key, which is uh, the command key or something like this, depending on, on your computer system. And then you just use the curver keys in order to move things around. So I have another little um, thing here. So this is just a demonstration of structure. I think here we have five main headlines. And now the first thing which we are going to do is just take this first, no, actually I'm folding it open, I'm opening the outline that you can see all the subheadings. Now we take the first heading and we just um, slide it down. We move it through the entire outline to the end, and then we move it back up. You can, uh, down here you can see the keys which are being pressed, we move it back up. 
So the next thing which we are going to do is to take the second headline and just move the entire subtree, which is below us, a little bit down. It should have, yeah, it has happened now. That's right. Even further now. And now we go down and now we demote the setting. So we make this actually a child of this one. Yes, and the next thing is that we make this entire subtree also one level down. And then we decide that this subheading here should actually be a subheading up here. So we just promote it and slide it up. And um, it looks a little bit tedious, but if you try this out, this works really fast and gets, uh, gets thoughts which initially were quite random, gets them into an order. I use this all the time. So I'm sitting in a meeting, make these notes. Afterwards, I take 10 minutes to reorganize things and I have a nice structured thing which I can uh, send to others, even as notes. I want to go to the next slide. Yes. Is it already the next slide? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. It's all text files. Huh? That's what I said. Altmut lets you do more with an outline, not only uh, take notes, but you can actually make um, notes in the outline, mark them as action items. That's also important. You sit in a meeting, you write down notes, and you find out uh, that there's something, something that we have to work with. And that's why it has some kinds of metadata, which is just uh, what this uh, slide represents. So we can just put in special text in special locations, which can mean special things. It's not really special text. It's actually also just plain text. But by some commands in Altman, it will be interpreted as something uh, more complicated. So for example, this first thing here, this is something which we call the to-do keyword. So by default, this is just either the word to-do or the word done. This means uh, like a checkbox on off. Either we still have to do this or it is already done. Next thing is a priority. You can assign uh, priorities if you want. Then you can assign tags. So just like, for example, this is something that has to do something with Word and it's something which I want to buy. And um, the other thing is that, you, that we can put planning information. For example, we can say this has a deadline. It has to be done at a certain time. So that you get a keyword and then the date after it in order to say when this has to be finished. And then uh, down here, this is what we call a property drawer. So this is just a lot of keyword value pairs where you can put arbitrary information. And it's, you're actually completely free in what you want to put here and how you want to write it down here. Uh, and by default, this doesn't really have any meaning. But there are, pro are commands and which assign meanings to this and do something with this special data. OK. Then um, it lets, allows you to make links. So if you just write something which looks like a link, and a link into the text, it will actually be interpreted one. So if you click on it or if you call a special command, that means it will open something. For example, you can put, in, put a URL or a link to a certain file and also specify how you want to have opened it. Or there's a, you can put an email address there. If you click on this, uh, you can send an email to this. And there's, so there's many different types of links. This is not even a complete list which you, uh, which you can put in there can also be very useful, I think. OK, I said that uh, you can embed tasks. And this is what is also shown here in a, in a sort of in a bigger way. So we actually have a piece of an outline here. Here's a, a major headline, a level two, level three headlines down here. And here's even level four headlines. And as you can now see here, I have defined a few more keywords here. So here's one which has to do. So this is something which has to be done. Here's one which says, this is done. That means this task is already finished. And why is it finished? Well, because below this task, there's a couple of other ones. One we have actually canceled. So that means we decided actually not to do this, even though initially it was a to-do item. And then there's another one which is already done. And that means uh, this task is done. And you can actually get here a little calculation of uh, what fraction of the task uh, is finished. So in this case, it's one of two. And then on this level, it's only the first one is not finished, the second uh, is and so that's why there's a one of two uh, is uh, finished up here. Yeah, so, and um, this is something which I also use very often. For example, I write an outline for a paper. I write uh, all those headlines, the subheadlines which I want to make, and then I can just mark things uh, like uh, I have to look into this, I have to do that, and can mark it there. It's in, in, hidden in this paper, but as I will show you in a, in a moment, you can actually then pull out this information into an easy list where you can then see what is uh, still, to, still to be done. We also have checkboxes, so you can uh, have, uh, this, this is all just plain text. Huh? This is just a bracket, an X and a bracket 
highlighted in a special font. That's why it looks like a, like a real box, but it's really all plain text. Just a checkbox, so this is what I imagine, what kind of experiment you do here in this institute, so that you need electricity and brains of rats to study and brains of humans to study. So I don't know. Yeah? Okay, checkboxes. Also something very useful. Make lists and tick things off. Then another thing is that uh, you can write tables in plain text, which is uh, really crazy, and some people have laughed at me for this, but uh, I implemented it anyway because I think it's uh, great fun. So here's just a little demonstration that you uh, can write tables in plain text. In a very simple way, you just uh, write the names of the fields and you separate them by uh, vertical bars as, as your columns. So this would be exam results from a couple of students. And so it automatically expands. You can you see as I write here, the field width um, adapts automatically. It's still, it, everything is plain text. So you can just uh, print this on a paper and read it in a different program and it will still look exactly, uh, exactly like this. So this is a couple of students where I'm just writing down the notes here. Names I get longer and longer to show you that the fields automatically adapt. And then another thing which I've built uh, in, into this is that you can actually do some calculations. So for example, you can just uh, calculate the sum of all these nodes. Just a little formula, it's uh, the sum of the fields which you put in there. And it will calculate that in plain text, everything plain text, for everything. And then you can also calculate the, aver calculate the average if you want, which is also what we are going to do here, the average of these results. So it's just uh, this value divided by three. Wow, there's too many digits. So let's uh, just uh, go back, back up, uh, get back into this formula, and uh, just uh, append a, a format specifier to this. So if you're a programmer, you will recognize this as a printf format specifier. And so you just uh, can format these, uh, these numbers nicely. And then you can reorganize this table. So here it's sorted now by the highest cipher. And that's just like the structure editing just basically holding the meta key and pulling these fields and rows uh, around. I, I don't know any table program which actually makes it easier to reorganize uh, that table uh, than this program. So, okay, it's a bit, uh, a, bit, a bit crazy, I admit, but I think it's still very useful. If you make notes, that you can make little tables and add a few numbers. For example, the other day I was sitting with a student, we were writing a proposal and we needed to add up the times which we needed for certain observations. And you can just do that in your notes, you add uh, quickly up these numbers and uh, send an email to the others what this is. Okay, so now for a bigger view, how does this now look like? I'm just going to show you a few example screens. This is uh, real life, my um, example file. This is a file where I collect meeting notes. It's just one giant file, it's a very long file. But I have a major note for all the different meetings uh, where I'm going to, where I'm listening uh, to other people. So there's always a major note for this. Sometimes I put a date when this uh, really was. And then below these notes, I have uh, further outlines of uh, when people talked, what they talked about, and just organizing these things. And as you can see here, when in there I mark a little task where I say, oh, this is something I have to act on. Sometimes I put a date telling me this is as a deadline here, you have to be aware of this, and it's happening in the notes file. So the advantage is, it's not that you have to go to your calendar and put an alarm there and say, well, I have to be aware of this, and then you have this information in two different places, which is always bad, because when you change it, you will usually add, change only one side of it and not both sides of it. So it's, it's here in, the, in, in this information, and it's, I mean, this is a huge file. You don't you see only a very small fraction of this because I've been using this program now for a couple of years and all my meeting notes are in this file. There's a command in output which tells me, well, show me everything which I still have to do. So that goes to this meeting note file, but also to other files which have to do with different projects, files which have to do with my teaching, and just pull out all those lines which say there's something to do. So I can just go through this list and check, well, there's something, what, what do I like to do now? How much time do I have? I can just pick the task and then jump from there into my notes file, work on this stuff, tick it off in the notes file, and then it will disappear from this list. I find that extremely useful. The other, another view which you can get on your data is, uh, is um, called, I'm going to close this door. Another useful view is the agenda. 
and that is just a calendar. So as you can see here, this lists one week, starts with Sunday, 7th of February, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And for every day, it pulls out tasks where I have somewhere set in my file where this is something to do. And there's a couple of them. For example, here is one which says it has been scheduled already 14 times. That means I wanted to work on this 14 days ago. So the bigger this number gets, the more scared I should get. And uh, then there's, here's one which has been scheduled for today. These are just pre-warnings, which says in eight days there's a deadline co up, coming up, which is related to the task which is here. So I have to write some proposals and things like this uh, for this deadline. And it's coming up here. And then also for the next days, it just gives me a preview of things which are coming towards me, uh, towards me where I have to pay attention. And as I said, all the data is just in one place. So there's another duplication. I can sit here with my cursor on this line. I can say, this is now done. It asks me for a little note. So what have you done with this? It will put the note into the outline leaf where this was, uh, was formed, will change the to-do key or to done. And I will never see this task again. Only if I go back to my notes and read actually what did I do with this project, then I will still find this task. It was done, and there will be a reason why it was done and when. So this is how this works. OK, <clears throat> scientists. I'm a scientist, and I wrote this program initially in order to organize my projects. So that you can actually organize also when you have to buy uh, a present for your kids that uh, came later. But that was the original idea. And so what I was hoping with Awkward is that you can put as much as possible um, relating to the planning of the program, to the scheduling, to the notes, can put that into a single file. That uh, was what I was hoping. So, notes, notes, notes. I, I cannot emphasize this, emphasize this enough. I think this is the daily bread and butter of a scientist. I'm getting into an age where I forget everything, and so I have to write down notes, and I do this really constantly can put into that same file, you can put your project schedule and the due dates, just wherever it belongs. <clears throat> you mark things and say, that has to be done, and when, and, and by when, OK? What else can you put Can put in? You can put a detailed log of actions and progress. You can just uh, write uh, for every day. You can write a little note and say, well, what, what did I do there? And it will be all in that same project file will not be in a different place. It will be in the right place. You can put the complete specification of the steps which you have taken in the analysis, which is hugely useful. If you do this here in a nice way, and I will show you later that you can very easily then turn the outline where you have specified this into a draft for a paper. So if you write this in your notes, you almost have it already, well, it's half done for a paper. You have, you have to write an article for publications. I'm sure that you uh, are also as pressed as we are for constant publishing. Publish or perish. This is also important for us. So an article for publication or a digital slideshow, a slideshow. And all these things can be at least drafted in this file. Sometimes you can actually completely prepare them in an Ordnet file, but uh, you can at least uh, draft them in there. There's even a facility to, to, uh, to track uh, data acquisition in a, in a graphical way. I'm going to say a little bit about this. This is a, a bit more complicated, so it's not so easy to, uh, to say this in, in the short time which I have. OK, so let's start with, with publishing. Now we have all this data in, an, in a text file. Of course, we all know that when you have to publish something, when you have to write a, a publication or a presentation, that is different file formats. Huh? We have to, I don't know if you to write a Word file in the end. I have to write a LaTeX file. This is an accepted document uh, format which we have. Um, another way to publish things is, of course, to put them on the web. And, um, or you can put something into Docbook, uh, Docbook which is an HTML-like format. LaTeX, as I said, is a text formatting thing which is very good for science if you have to, uh, uh, to put them in the equations, which is what we have to do. So this is very important. And in the end, you get a PDF file out of this. Um, you can make a Beamer presentation that is also via LaTeX a presentation which uh, you can show on the screen. There's an, an export to ASCII which makes an even more readable way of uh, reading the same file, even though the output file itself is already very readable, of course. And then um, you can also link a couple of documents and actually, for example, publish an entire 
web page from these from these files. So let's look at an example. So here yeah, so I'm just making a toy project. Uh, figure out how planets form. Of course, this is not really my project. Of course, I would like to figure out how planets form, but in reality, I guess the same is true for you, is that um, projects are always much smaller, but I'm just uh, so that it's easy to understand I've taken a big project here. So, for example, I have a task here that I should study some literature, and after a while I'm done with this, so I've read this literature. Then I'm going to discuss with my co-worker uh, on a certain date, and we have a couple of ideas of how this could be done. So these, uh, these are to do, so I want to still look them into them. This here means started, so that means that we have started uh, thinking about this. And then, but then we have decided that this first idea is garbage, so we, uh, we uh, cancel it. And then there's more to more ideas, so we just work on them. We have a little table where we make an estimate. We estimate a couple of numbers which we need for this project. Okay, so now you have um, this kind of a project. And now let's uh, see what we can do with this. So let's try to export this in the different ways. For example, here's off that page. It's, uh, I'm just going back one more time. Uh, I'm sorry. So this is the text file. And this is off that same file the HTML export. So it's just a one press of a button and uh, that thing turns into an HTML page which contains all the information. Here is a nicely formatted table. Here is a table of contents which is clickable. You can just click on these side of things go there. So without any extra work, you have put this thing up on the web. Here's uh, the LaTeX version of this. And then you can discuss if you actually like the way this looks, of course, because this, uh, this file was very list-oriented, so there's many headlines and uh, two little text in between. But, but even if you decide to work on the LaTeX file itself, you can still get your first version, your draft version in this. You can sit in the text editor writing a text file, focus totally on the content, get the structure right, then turn it into that pretty file and uh, fix it a little bit and uh, send it to the publisher. Um, I've really made the experience in the last few years that this is a very efficient way of doing things. Well, you can turn that same file, it's really not different, I haven't done anything, the same file, turn it into a, into a presentation. This is done with the Beamer package, which also goes through LaTeX, which is uh, the third mode in, in, in my file is one slide. This is this discussion with my colleague. So these different ideas are here on the table. It's in the presentation. So you get, can also get your draft presentation with no extra work. It's all coming from the same source. OK. Um, there's uh, further things which you can, can do as a scientist with this, uh, with this kind of stuff. And I'm only going to, going to briefly touch on them because they are a bit more complex. Um, you can embed LaTeX commands uh, for formulas into an Altman file. If you need a, a more complex equation in there, you can just uh, put it directly in there. I don't know if any people here use LaTeX and how much they, they do use it, um, but for us, this is extremely useful. You can embed source code snippets. So if you're working, for example, with R to do your, to do your analysis or with, uh, with the C code, or you can put little pieces of source code in there, which can be very useful, as I will show in a minute. You can actually run those source code snippets, and you can capture the results into a table. So it's a little bit like Mathematica in a way, as you can do some calculations and work inside the document. And if you take this together, this actually puts you into a place that you can start doing reproducible research and literal programming with this uh, kind of a system. I'm not sure if you know these buzzwords. I'm going to say a little bit more about it. So here's just an example of embedded LaTeX. Again, this is uh, one of those text files. And I've just written here the big letter letters alpha, beta, and gamma are used to denote angles. And alpha is the way to write angles uh, in, uh, uh, to write Greek letter letters in LaTeX. So this is how you write it. Normally in LaTeX, you would actually have to put two dollar signs on both sides in order to mark them as mass. This is not necessary in alt mode. You can just write them plainly in there and it will actually find them and convert them in the right way. Then there's another thing. I've actually put here two slashes around a little bit of text and that is in all mode, the short form to say that you actually want to have this in italics. This is uh, sort of the same specification as we use in, e in emails. Huh? If, you, uh, if you just uh, write these slashes, that means some emphasis. And then down here is a little equation, and that is literally how you would also write, write this in LaTeX. And you can just put it there if it's a bit more complex. And then if you turn this into LaTeX with a single button, then you will see this down here. So this is just 
section heading and then the sentence which I've written and here down here is a beautifully formatted equation as uh, LaTeX does this for, me, for you. Another thing is, are these embedded code examples? For example, I'm writing together with my colleague a little piece of code in order to study this problem in planet formation. And so this is a little snippet from the code which we are, which we are using there. And initially, actually, I put in this possibility to say, well, here is some Fortran 90, in this case, code in there. That was only for documentation purposes, because I wanted to be able to say, well, this is a piece of code, and then please format this nicely for me on an HTML page. And so this uh, was what this was made for. We now have an HTML page, page from exactly this, where then this source code gets nicely formatted and colored and uh, so that you can easily look at this. It's very nice if you have to write software and have to document it in a way. What then happened was actually totally unexpected. There's a couple of people on the mailing list where we discuss about Ordmos. Eric Schulte, I'm all oh, Eric Schulte, I misspelled the Schulte. There should be a T. And then Davidson, Davidson, they actually said, well, this is interesting. So there's little snippets of code in there. Why don't we just build a facility to run these pieces of code and to capture the output? So what they have done with here is, for example, I don't know if anyone of you recognizes this is a piece of R code. And it's been used to take a file and to split it into words and to look at the words which are most frequently used in that text. Takes the first six of them and turn them into a table. And the table, the output table, is uh, right in here. Yeah, so we can run this stuff in the file and uh, get, uh, get the result. This might seem a little bit academic, and I think that for many of you, it might well be that this is not really what you are going to do. But if you are more interested in computer science and in documenting things and into writing the documentation of a program together with the program itself, this uh, may be something uh, you, uh, you would find interesting. <clears throat> that has to do with literal programming. It's an important um, thing. I think you can computer scientists maybe start in a way by Donald Knuth, who has defined what this is. So let's try to find a way to write computer programs where the main aim is not explaining to the computer what it should do, but explaining to other human beings what we want the computer to do. So that means that you actually write something which is human readable together with the code. And Ordmode also allows you to do this. And if you have a program like this, and there's two operations, one is called weave, and that makes a printable document. That's just the export Ordmode does anyway. And then there's a tangle operation, which throws away all the text which is meant for the humans and only takes the code for the computer. And uh, you can also do that with the, with the program which uh, was uh, written by, by Eric Schulte and uh, Dan Davidson. Yeah, reproducible research is the other side of, of this. Um, that means that in reproducible research, you try to combine the scientific results with all the tools that they use to produce them. Because if you make a, paper, make a figure, which you show in the paper, people should, in principle, be able to verify that figure, to check if you have really done uh, your homework well, homework well. And so this is what's called reproducible research. And what I've explained about this, uh, this old bubble stuff lets you do some of this also with odd mode. Okay, enough of that. I think that uh, leads us a little bit uh, too far. I'm going to just finish with a couple of slides with a few links. So if you want to know more about odd mode, there's a, we have a website here, oddmode.org, which of course was made in org mode. So we actually use plain text files to make this website and then just publish it. I have given another talk like this, not quite like this, but a bit similar at Google. Uh, one and a half years ago, I think you can uh, look at that if you want. We have a long list of tutorials which you can look at. And there's a mailing list uh, where we discuss about alt mode. And there's another site which is called Work, uh, which is a user-made site uh, where we collect documentation and more information about this, um, about this uh, project. If you are an iPhone user, there's actually an iPhone application, which means that you can take all these notes files with you. That's actually nice. I mean, all the notes which I said, which I've made over the last years, I have on my little iPod Touch and can look things up if I want. And you can actually tick tasks off from here, and then when you sync back, it will actually be changed in your, in your files. It's very nice. Richard Norland wrote this application. A lot of fun. The users of Ordmode are really wildly different. 
So that's, uh, if you look at this list, you will see that it's really not, not only made for scientists or not only made for a particular kind of people. This is just a, a collection from the website, which is uh, uh, one web page um, where people actually introduce themselves. Uh, Stefan also has an entry on that site. For example, we have an archaeologist in Hawaii who runs his archaeology company using org. And he writes his research, he gets his results and publishes them mainly through Altmont. I think that's uh, really a lot of fun. Uh, another guy is a farmer who organizes stuff on his farm, and he's also a mountaineer. There's scientists and computer scientists. There are several one-person companies who run the entire company on this system. Um, but there's also bigger things. Uh, one of the people there is the director of a computer science company and of a university research group. We have a historian. There's a blind person who runs his entire life through Emacs. And he really loves Altmode because it's a program which he can use inside Emacs where, where he knows his way. And uh, oh, the head of the IT group here at the Max Planck Institute also uses Altmode, obviously. As we all know, I guess. Well, this is a world of Twitter these days. Today you have all to say everything you have to say in 140 characters. So I've collected a couple of things which I found on the Twitter feed what people have said. So not everybody is entirely positive. So for example, this one, I like this one. The sheer elaborated insanity of the alt mode spreadsheet is a distilled microcosm of all that is wonderful and brain damaged about Emacs. And I think that's really a very true and very nice statement. But Emacs is, if you see it like this, brain damaged, but it's really wonderful. And I love it. I don't want to be anywhere else. There's more people who think like this. For example, this guy says, if I hated everything about Emacs, I would still use it for alt mode. Or Eric Frager, also one of the people on the mailing list. Eric is actually the one who drove the Beamer presentation export. He was uh, very important for this. He says, I used to, it used to be that I hated leaving Emacs to do anything. Now it's getting to the point that I hate leaving alt mode. So people really use this as the main environment in which they do everything. Well, not everybody would uh, get as extreme as uh, Chris Leak, I guess. <laughs> okay, I'm almost done, I think. Yes, there's a list of acknowledgments, which I still want to say, because many people are contributing to this uh, program, and also in particular to the stuff which I've shown you today. There's a mailing list. I, I can, really cannot believe it. We have now 800 people on this mailing list, which uh, read that mailing list all the time. There's at least 20 messages a day. Some days there are 30 or 40 or 50 messages on this list. Um, and all really good messages. There's uh, no garbage here. It's amazing. Then Eric Schult and I have spelled them correctly, thank God. And Dan Davidson, they wrote Org Barber, which is really a major extension. Thomas S. Dye um, has written some examples which I've used here. Sebastian Rose, Bastian de Rory, uh, Bauki Sui, if that is pronounced correctly, and Eric Frager, all have been really important for some of the exporters which we have. Richard Morland is a guy who wrote Mobile Org, the iPhone application, and gives it away for free, so you don't have to pay for it. You have a donation button on this webpage, so if you still want, feel free to. And I would like to th uh, thank Stefan uh, for inviting me here today. And I will be, I'm still around for the rest of the day, so I hope I will see some of the science which is being done at this institute, because it's, I'm actually really interested in brain research. And for the rest, if you have any questions now or later during the day, please uh, just uh, get in touch with me. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, access to the standard Emacs version control. Yes. And just uh, uh, use, uh, you can put all the org file files under version control. Mm -hmm. I definitely do this because it means that you can freely and without any fear edit and change things like crazy. And then just use the standard version control system to keep the uh, versioning of all these files. Yes, very good idea, always. Yeah. Um, what kind of action like start, wait, to do, cancels are also available, or is it good to, to create my own actions or tests? Standard, if you download Outlook and install it, it only has two, which is to do and done.
But you can very easily, I mean, just in the top of the file, you just write hash mark plus. This is always a sign that uh, you, you want to so want to declare something and then to do. And afterwards, you just put a list of all the words which you want to be action words, and then they are. Okay. Um, are there tutorials um, to tell me which are good <coughs> actions, or is yes. it better to, to have few actions or many different actions? Well, that really depends on taste. And for me, it actually even depends on file. So for example, um, if I'm organizing something with many other people together, then I like to make names of everybody who is involved to-do keywords. So I can just assign every task which is listed there directly with a to-do keyword to the person. You can also use tags if you want, but you can also use a to-do keywords. I myself have, um, let me think, I may have maybe eight or nine action keywords, very little. I know that some people have 50. No, they just use it in a, in a different way. So um, I think that's really one of the strong points of Ordmo, that it actually lets you define this freely and also make, lets you make it different for every file. So if you have uh, a special task, a special thing which you have to do, you can uh, just change it for that, uh, for that thing. When what I normally do is uh, use this uh, to do and then start it. It means I've started with this. Waiting means, well, I'm just waiting for someone. That means I have to check back if they have really finished it. And then it's done and canceled and delegated. And then I have, this, have something similar on a higher level for a project which I use to, de to designate things which have many subtasks in a tree below them. Um, but that's basically all I use. So I use a small one, and I think that's actually much better for my users. Yeah? Yeah? Um, would it be possible to extract an outline, say, from source code files where you have to do points or something like that? Um, there's nothing built in right now, but yes, source code files are text files, and uh, Ordmo files are text files. I think I can write you a one-liner in Perl, which will take uh, your source code and put out an Ordmo tree, uh, which uh, contains all the to-do tasks in that source code. I think that's very easy. Uh, maybe not a one-liner, maybe a three-liner, but uh, um, yes. And of course, if you, you know how to write Emacs Lisp, then you can also write it in Emacs. But many people just know different uh, scripting languages like Python or Perl or something like this, and they would prefer to use that, and that's perfectly possible. It's, that's why it's all text files, because it's uh, so easy in this way. You can also, there's, for example, a Python module which will parse an Orkmut file and return a tree structure which contains uh, the outline tree, and then you can manipulate it and do something with it. Yes. When you use the heading and subheading uh, 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 line, the numbering should not change when you move the back. That's correct. The, um, yes, that's I right. The numbering which I had shown there was just uh, for illustration in order to show you what the original structure was in order to see that actually something changes when I move them around. But then normally you would not number it. In odd in mode, these things are an outline and you would not number the nodes, but you can get them numbered when you export. So if you say, I want to export this to HTML or to Latex, then you can get a, a numbered outline. Then you would have to change the numbering. But yeah, no, you would just wouldn't write them. I mean, I can, uh, let me just see if I can get this to work here. I'm not sure if you can read it. Really? That's pretty cool. Just uh, wait a second for Emacs to come up. I think it has to recover from everything that's going on in this machine. Okay, so let's uh, just, uh, um, so one thing is we do have enum uh, uh, enumerated lists, so ordered lists, so I've, I've just started writing just the garbage text here. Um, then you can see that, the, no, this is not right. Yeah, so this is an enumerated list. And if you all reorganize this, and this works exactly the same, so I hold down the meta key and then I use the cursor key to pull up and down, you will actually see that it moves up and down and does the, do the renumbering. Uh, but normally in an outline, so this would be head sub, and this is just text, huh? and you would just would not number it. But you can still change a level, of course, like this, move it in and out. Or swap it with the other one and lose the level of this, but uh, that doesn't show show numbers normally. Yeah, you have the numbers that you I had, yeah, I just had it at the at the side only to illustrate that there is a structure and that these are meant as uh, sublevels, but I'm not using them. So that, that was uh, 
They were just text, not really numbers. Yeah, no, exactly. Just don't type numbers. It's a very, it's the laziest way of typing numbers is not to type them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, often it's for lazy people. This is one of the reasons I love tables, and I don't find them crazy at all, because um, tables and all those match to tables in HTML, they match to tables in context. Yes. Well, yeah, that's uh, true. Uh, certainly, if you want to, uh, if you are looking towards the output formats, yeah, it's actually a much easier way of making tables. For example, when I have to make a table in LaTeX, I never write this in LaTeX anymore because it, I just hate it. It's very difficult to read, and we actually have a special way which I didn't explain here today, but uh, I did explain this. Uh, I do explain this in uh, in my talk at Google that you can actually, for example, in your C source code or in your LaTeX file, you can actually. Put a special section, which is actually a comment for LaTeX, where you have a normal org mode table, and then with one key, it gets actually turned into a LaTeX table and inserted at the right location in the table. So you can, in place, almost use this much nicer syntax and much easier way of looking at tables in order to edit and make that table and then still have it, exp have it in the proper format for LaTeX. We use it very often. In fact. I could try to demonstrate it, but I'm not sure if I'm fast enough uh, to do this. Yeah? Where can I get a t-shirt like yours? <laughs> <laughs> um, there is, uh, on our website, okay. org. there is uh, right at the top, and uh, if I think the t-shirts are something like 15 or 20 euro, and two of those euros get to me. So that's um, something like that. <laughs> so that I can stay a happy person and keep programming this uh, thing. Yes, and we have mugs, and we have uh, scarves, and bags, and so mm -hmm. full shop. A friend of mine made that. <laughs> yeah, more questions? Apparently not. Stefan, what should I do now? Just close the session? Yeah, I think we are done. Many thanks for coming up. And um, I go with a cool heart to implement the automotive mailing list, which is an excellent place to hang out. <laughs> for recreational reasons too. So, um, many thanks for coming and giving us this splendid talk. And um, if you have questions on how to run Emacs at the Institute, there will be um, something in our Institute wiki shortly. Because I hope this is what you're now all going to read. <laughs> <laughs>